I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers of today and the discussion. And uh, the title of this panel is The Social Sciences and Humanities in Times of Disruptions Grounding the, the Debate. After um, the words of the discussant, we will open the floor for questions or any, any points that you would like to, to bring to us. So while we are celebrating the anniversary of, of, of Codergia, uh, the team chosen by the Secretariat for this panel brings not only uh, different experiences of the Council, but also the ways in which we face challenges in times of permanent ruptures or disruptures. Uh, although the speakers of today are very well known, I'm going to do a very brief introduction of each one of them, beginning by uh, Adebayo uh, Olukoshi. Um, according to the, the, the names that are listed in, uh, in our program. I would like to say that uh, I feel very honored to chair this panel as I shared with the speakers, particularly with uh, the Bayo and Nugia, important moments in the life of, uh, of Codergia. Let me start by Adebayo. Adebayo is a distinguished professor at Witt School, Witt School of Governance in South Africa, and uh, with uh, an outstanding experience in the area of international relations, governance, and human rights, both in the academic sector and uh, intergovernmental institutions, where he played and uh, he used to play different roles. He is a member of the board of uh, several think tanks. He is the president uh, or the chair of the scientific committee of uh, Codergia and former executive secretary of uh, Codergia. Uh, the Biolokoshi published extensively, as you can see uh, in the publications of Codergia and uh, other editors. Uh, Professor Nuria Remaun is also a well-known Algerian sociologist, author and researcher, and he is the former director of the National Center for Research and Cultural Anthropology and former Minister of National Education and also former member of the uh, Codergia Executive Committee. Professor Ismael Rashid, on my left, he is a professor of history at uh, Vassar College in the US, director of African Studies uh, program, former chair of the SSR African Peace Building Network, and research mentor as an extensive also uh, uh, list of publications. Finally, our discussant is Ato Onoma in my, in my left. Uh, is professor at the University of Toronto in Canada. Ato served Codergia for about near, near a decade, I, I think. And um, he uh, contributed immensely to different Codergia programs, particularly the research program. Therefore, I would like to invite Bayo. I can give you 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And uh, I feel honored to be part of this uh, panel. And what I would like to do is um, uh, share some thoughts of a broadly uh, conceptual historical nature around the uh, theme uh, of this panel. Um, my starting point is uh, to echo what the Executive Secretary Godwin uh, indicated in his uh, welcoming statement. We live in a period of change. But I guess that is probably the easiest thing to assert. Because after all, one can argue that change 
has always been a constant and remains a constant in our world and our lives. Um, so as to say that we live in a period of change is really to state the obvious. Um, and the social sciences and humanities, uh, as part of our endeavors, have at different points in time tried to be both chroniclers and interpreters of these change processes that define our everyday existence. However, it seems to me that over and above such an assertion, one can argue and make the case further by asking what it is that is unique about this particular moment of change. And it seems to me that the shortcut answer to that question will be to understand the moment, not only in terms of the dynamics of change taking place, but the confluence of factors and drivers of change that come together at the same time as to give us the impression that we are at the end of an era in the history of the world and in a certain sense looking at the pathways that are manifesting themselves towards the emergence of a new era. The dimensions and contours of change are multiple from climate to demographics to uh, the shifts even within the structure of accumulation itself from what was an industrial era to an era of financialization and so on and so forth. Elements and dimensions of change which have been reflected in much of the intellectual agenda of the council over the last 20 to 30 years. The demographic change particularly being an important one for our continent, but being part and parcel also of a process of the reconfiguration and redistribution of power on a global scale. A process which, very roughly speaking, is seeing the pendulum of power and the hierarchy of relations shifting away from what we would call the collective West towards what we might call the collective East, a swing in the redistribution of power that is captured in the metaphor of a reemergent China and India, but not exactly limited only to those two uh, important actors in the international economic system. Um, a whole host of middle powers, which previously under a dominant uh, power system that we knew as Pax Americana was subdued and subordinated to the will of the collective West, finding their space and their autonomy almost to reclaim their own identity in the actions of countries like Turkey, even of Saudi Arabia, and a whole host of others that have also emerged on the scene. And that is probably the reason why, again, to refer to the um, welcoming statement of uh, Godwin earlier, um, the bulk of analysts take the view that we are seeing the reemergence in world history of a truly multipolar order, a truly multipolar system in which power is much more diffuse with all of the consequences that go with that. Mainstream international relations scholars would argue that in fact, what we are also seeing is the end of the post-1945 Pax Americana and the global multilateral system that was built on it. Presenting itself, marketing itself as a rules-based order in which, at least on the face of it, within the framework of the United Nations system, all nations uh, weighted equally, even if within the framework of the Security Council, it also became quite clear that that post-1945 order was an order constructed 
for the victors in the Second World War in terms of the veto which they arrogated to themselves in what is supposed to be a global system of collective security, but also in terms of the weight that they carry in key institutions of global governance like the World Bank, uh, the IMF, and even what is today known as the WTO. So basically, in sum, one can argue that the confluence of factors that have manifested themselves and come together um, uh, as elements of a change process as to give that impression and even the impetus of a shift in the balance of power in the international system um, is one which we are confronted with. Now, characterizing that process of change has not been an easy exercise at all in the literature. Um, between the extremes of those who are overly enthusiastic and proclaim already that we have a new era before us, and those who are eternally optimistic that the old is still far more resilient than we give it credit for, it seems to me that there is, in fact, a middle point which is summarized by the idea of a more diffuse multipolar order in which we might have to find our own level um, as the uh, continent of Africa. I'd like to recall here that in the making of the contemporary world order, um, at the time that Pax Americana came of its own, those who argued that Pax Britannica, the old British order that dominated the world for almost two or more centuries, those who argued about its resilience were probably not sufficiently aware of the structural shifts that were taking place in the world economy until the 1940s. Uh, you might recall that Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister of, of the UK at the time, reassuring his own people, basically saying that the end of the British Empire was not about to happen. The same thing with Winston Churchill, who faced with the question of decolonization after the Second World War, basically again argued that he hadn't been elected prime minister to preside over the dissolution of the British Empire. But dissolution was bound to happen. And as the process gathered pace, much of the elements that went into the making of the contemporary world system were negotiated and defined amongst the victors of the Second World War, mainly to the exclusion of the countries of Africa. Most of Africa still very much under colonial rule and therefore not partaking in any uh, shape or form of a direct nature in the definition either of the key values underpinning the multilateral system or even the rules that will guide the making of a post-1945 uh, Pax uh, Americana. Um, the best which we got out of it, essentially, was the adoption of the Atlantic Charter that recognized the rights of peoples to self-determination and which fed into the building momentum of anti-colonial struggle um, across Asia, India in particular, and the rest of Africa, um, and laid the foundation for the march towards independence. But at the same time as the Atlantic Charter uh, gave some kind of um, political legitimacy to the struggles for independence, we also saw the emergence uh, of an intensified struggle for civil rights uh, in the Americas. Uh, civil rights struggles that were embodied, symbolized by Martin Luther King Jr., uh, which in any case uh, predated him, gathered momentum uh, under his leadership and became part and parcel of an attempt to redefine uh, dignity for the African in the post-1945 order. And as far as the African continent itself was concerned, the landmark year would be 1945, the Manchester Conference, 
um, which basically brought together some of the leading um, liberation figures of the time, Kwame Nkrumah and others, uh, to lay out the case for African independence and to give a charge to those who were in Manchester uh, to participate, to go back and participate in the independence uh, struggle. A struggle which culminated in the independence of the Sudan in 1956, but perhaps even more symbolically important, the independence of Ghana in 1957. So three elements in so far as the African world was concerned in the making of the post-1945 order, the Atlantic Charter, the civil rights movement, and the revival of Pan-Africanism and its transportation into the African, to the mainland uh, continent as a key ideological and political vehicle for the national liberation struggle. Much of our struggles as scholars in the framing of the social sciences in this period, I would argue, consisted of a combination of a scholarship of resistance, a scholarship of protest, a scholarship of reinterpretation, seeking to retrieve our own history and be the owners of our own narrative, and a scholarship of liberation. All of these, in a certain sense, occurring simultaneously together. Resistance to colonial domination and therefore scholarship in support of the independence struggles. Protest against some of the excesses of colonialism, the struggle for freedom, and the struggle for national liberation. And in a certain sense, it is also what defines the core mission and mandate which Kodesria came to embody when it was established in 1973, doing so for the first time by transcending national boundaries and seeking to provide a Pan-African platform precisely for the prosecution of a scholarship of resistance, of protest, of freedom, and of liberation. And I miss some of the debates that, take, that took place um, uh, in that period, uh, even if there were some quite sharp ideological differences. It seems to me that much of our scholarly production as social scientists and scholars of the humanities were embedded in these four processes that I argue occurred simultaneously. Part of the critique, part of the resistance, part of the scholarship of liberation also included discrediting some of the key intellectual pillars on which the post-1945 order was built. Challenging the inequality of the order, challenging the inconsistencies of that order, challenging the hypocrisy that was embedded in the order, and basically exposing Pax Americana for what it really was um, as simply um, a system in which might ultimately seemed to be right. And to the extent to which morality became a part of the discourses of the day, it was only to the extent to which alliances could be forged to have a common uh, understanding of some of the more unacceptable excesses, either of transnational corporations or of regimes such as the apartheid system in South Africa uh, and a number of such uh, instances. But it was all an uneven process and pattern, an uneven process in which, in some instances, victories were won by the kind of scholarship into which we invested ourselves as a community, but also instances in which whatever we said or did did not seem to matter too much to the dominant hegemonic forces uh, in the system. And I don't think there is a better metaphor uh, for which we can um, uh, express this contradictoriness in the record of the post-1945 uh, resistance, protest, uh, freedom, and liberation dy dynamic than the fact that before our very eyes, having historically defeated apartheid in South Africa and even settler colonialism 
in parts of Southern Africa, we are witnessing yet a reincarnation of a new apartheid order and a new, more rapacious kind of hegemonic order uh, being inflicted on the people of Palestine. And not for want of the fact that there was also a literature and a scholarship of resistance and of protest, of freedom and of liberation um, embodied by a whole generation uh, of scholars uh, in that part of the world and those in solidarity with them, including the likes of Edward, uh, the late Edward uh, Said. Um, by the 1990s, end of the so-called Cold War, um, which some baptized as the end of history and celebrated as effectively the arrival of a unipolar order, we also saw that the seeds of the destruction of the post-1945 Pax Americana were in fact becoming much more obvious and evident in the reemergence of China, in the reemergence of India, and as I indicated earlier, the range of powers that were at play um, to challenge uh, what they saw as the um, unacceptable elements of the asymmetries of the post-1945 period, while simultaneously seeking also to rebuild the basis and foundation of their own power in the international system. Now, how do we understand this moment? At the very general level, amongst our political leaders at least, there is a tendency to believe that the end or the apparent end of one order and the emergence or what looks like the emergence of a new order provides us an opportunity simply to substitute one old alliance with a new alliance. And I summarize this under the slogan, look east, the so-called look east policy of um, some of the governments of the continent. I think officially, in fact, the government of Zimbabwe under Mugabe formally adopted a look east policy uh, as a counter to Western sanctions and uh, some of the unilateral excesses that uh, some of the Western powers uh, undertook. Now, my argument essentially is to say, like Gramsci, that the old may be dying. The new is struggling to be born. In the interim, as Gramsci said, there are monsters and monsters are being unleashed. Whilst this struggle between the old and the new play themselves out, what we see, in fact, is a trying moment in world history, which, if we are lucky, will not necessarily result in war as a way of resolving the power struggle. Essentially, historians have reminded us that no major shift in the configuration of power in the international system has happened without a war. Others have suggested that actually even the COVID-19 pandemic is itself reflective of the centennial uh, outbreak of pandemics that presage a change in global order. And not a few scholars have taken the view that the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly flowed into the dynamics of change in the international system as to announce the imminent birth of a new order. But that order has not been, been born yet. The old that is supposedly dying is carrying nuclear weapons and it is not going to go down without a fight. We can see that very clearly. The new that is emerging is being very careful. Uh, China talks of a peaceful rise that it wants to rise, but rise peacefully, at least as its ideology. But it is also busily arming itself in anticipation that a conflict might be inevitable in the international system. Whether this will be a nuclear Armageddon is open to anybody's guess. But at the end of the day, in the midst of this unleashing of the monsters, and it is monsters at various levels. At the political level, we are seeing extreme right groups that are seizing power 
in huge swathes of Europe in which actually our colleagues are talking about democratic recession and democratic backsliding in Europe, in the Americas, of uh, Donald Trump suddenly becoming a popular figure, uh, capturing the imagination of people. Uh, we see monsters of a political nature. We see monsters of an economic nature also playing themselves out and underwriting a more frequent cycle of crisis, of a systemic crisis in global accumulation. Of uh, monsters in the military industrial complex that are determined whilst making so much money to scale up and push the frontiers as it were uh, in the capacity of humans to destroy any meaningful life on earth. Um, surely in the context of all of this uncertainty, in the context of all of the um, doubts that have been created all around us in Africa as elsewhere, um, the task which it seems to me confronts us as social scientists, and I'll start to end on that basis, um, can be summarized under three or four broad rubrics. First and foremost is the importance, the absolute necessity for us as African scholars, as members of the Kodesia community, to have our own independent understanding of the change which is taking place. We cannot content ourselves simply with an interpretation of change processes on the basis of what the so-called global literature is presenting to us. Um, because in any case, change which takes place, as Chinua Achebe <laughs> said in one of his, uh, I think, Arrow of God, uh, the world is like a dancing masquerade, and you cannot stand on one spot and expect that you will understand the full dance of the masquerade. You need to move with it. And in moving with it, make your own judgment. Your location and your corner, where you stand, where you are, has an important implication for the reading and the interpretation which we make of the change which is taking place. So a massive investment in our research endeavors in understanding the contours and dynamics of change. In doing so, we must also not forget that as much as global change processes are being refracted into the continent, I'm using the word carefully, refracted into the continent of Africa, there are also change processes that are being driven from within Africa. And the confluence of internal change processes and external, externally refracted change into the political economy of our countries is something which will, refer, will require a very careful and nuanced reading and understanding. Um, throwing into it all of the elements that include the youthfulness of our population uh, amongst others that are fully at play in helping us to understand or to, 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 to see the complexity of the processes that confront us. I want to suggest also that now more than ever before, we need to invest in a much better understanding of how other parts of the world and other peoples of the world are themselves understanding the change that is taking place. And I'm not sure that we have in, we enough understanding, for example, to be able to say we know the mind of China, or that we know the mind of Russia, or that we know the mind even of the United States um, in the face of the changes taking place. Um, we know that in response to the shifts that are taking place, the United States under Joe Biden suddenly decided that it is going to make this a battle between democracies and authoritarian regimes, and then convene an annual conference of democracies and free people. Um, never mind that if you're an African-American and Black Lives Matter uh, as a key issue on your agenda, you are hardly likely going to see the United States as a democratic, as a land of democracy uh, as such. But this is the framing that works for them. It's the framing that helps them to build alliances. But we need to understand it a bit more. In the same way as China seems to be completely blank in most of our reading, of what is going on. 
what exactly does peaceful rise mean? What does unconditional aid really mean? Is there anything like unconditional aid and all of the arsenals which China has deployed as it has sought to build a global footing uh, for itself? And I can cite other examples. But basically, my point is that more than ever before, we need to invest ourselves in a much more intricate understanding of what other regions of the world are thinking. And this becomes even more urgent um, in the face of what, at a third level, I've called a new scramble for the African continent. Everybody around the world who has any iota of resources has a program for Africa. The most recent being the Saudi Africa Summit that took place in Riyadh. But everybody, the European Union has gateway uh, initiative. China has Belt and Road initiative. Russia has its own initiative. Um, we are convened to summits and told we are the beautiful bride. The problem, though, is that if you accept every dinner invitation that you receive, including multiple invitations on the same day, um, you might actually have to be treating obesity and other such ailments that follow an indiscriminate um, acceptance of every invitation. No strategic effort is being deployed sufficiently, either at the national level or at the level of our regional organizations in interpreting the change processes and seeing how Africa could be positioned. And it seems to me that for us as scholars, beyond protest, beyond resistance, beyond the struggle for liberation, this movement provides us a unique opportunity to build the kind of social science knowledge in the humanities interventions that we have always yearned for. What is democracy in our context? What is governance in our context? What does development mean at this point in time? Tied not only to our history, but also connected to our aspirations. Aspirations which, after 60 years of independence, cannot simply be limited to being given respect by the rest of the world, but to actually conquering the right as a member of the global community to be a joint rule maker as opposed to simply being a rule taker. It cannot be that a new world order will be constructed in our very eyes on the basis of struggles which we contributed to waging in order to arrive where we are today and we simply will accept the values that come from others, especially because we are unable to break out of the aid dependency framework and to assert an independent path for our development. Nobody owes Africa a living at the end of the day. Nobody owes Africa a living. And if any of us had any doubt whatsoever about this basic fact, the COVID-19 pandemic was a rude reminder for those who had any illusions whatsoever. Because when it came to crunch, the bulk of the dominant powers in the system had absolutely no hesitation to announce to thy tents, O Israel. We take care of our people first. When we are done, we will think about you. And we were left basically can in hand protesting about the unfairness of the system, about a new vaccine apartheid, about the new hegemonic powers of the pharmaceutical lobby, and so on and so forth. And in case that did not sink in sufficiently, I think we also need to remind ourselves about what happened at the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, and of the fact that in the end, the countries that were hit the hardest by food inflation and whose citizens were exposed to the worst levels of food insecurity were the people of this continent. And it had to be a very painful spectacle to watch a contingent of five African leaders 
going to Ukraine and going to Russia to beg for the blockade on the shipment of grains around the world, particularly to Africa, to be lifted so that regimes can survive the pressures coming from pop for the population uh, uh, with regard to food inflation. Nobody, therefore, owes Africa a living. And in taking this message to heart, it will be absolutely important for us to rethink all of the inherited concepts, concepts like sovereignty that prevent collective action as Africans. What does sovereignty mean on the basis of a fragmented 55 countries that are unable to even control drones that fly over their territory without authorization? What does independence defined in those narrow terms mean if we are not able to safeguard our own collective security and in the process put forward values which we think are important for um, safeguarding the overall survival and well-being of humanity. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. I rest my case. Thank you very much, Professor Olukoshi, for the points so important you, you brought this afternoon to our discussion and how to understand the moment. I'd like to invite uh, Nuria Remaun. Mas al khair, good afternoon. Azul Flaoun. C'est un très grand plaisir pour moi que de participer à cette 16e Assemblée générale du Codestria qui coïncide avec ses 50 ans et particulièrement ce panel consacré aux sciences sociales et humaines face à la crise. Alors moi, je vais m'appuyer sur une enquête nationale que nous avons conduite en mars 2021 au Centre de recherche en anthropologie sociale et culturelle qui est à Oran et qui a concerné donc 1200 ménages et près de 6000 individus. Alors nous souhaitions savoir ce que la société fait de ce que le politique lui dit ou impose de faire tout en sachant que la recherche relève d'un processus besogneux sur une question qui nécessitera certainement beaucoup de temps pour être construite sociologiquement. Donc, pour nous, mettre l'accent sur l'importance de l'observation, du recueil et de la construction des données pour produire un certain nombre de discours de vérité au pluriel. Alors, se saisir d'une crise comme analyseur des réalités sociales procède d'une posture méthodologique permettant d'appréhender le normal de l'exceptionnel au travers des logiques d'action des décideurs dans un contexte inédit d'absence de débat public et qui, plus est, ont très peu sollicité les sciences sociales qui, et les pouvoirs publics, se sont essentiellement appuyés sur le technico-médical au fin de fournir une base de légitimation aux prises de décision. À situation inédite, mesure inédite, allègement, par exemple, des programmes, passage en classe supérieure au-dessous de la moyenne, obtention du bac à partir de 9, moyenne aboutissant, en fait, à une remise en cause de la puissance normative des institutions. Un focus particulier sera fait sur l'école et nous nous poserons la question de savoir en quoi la pandémie a joué un rôle d'accélérateur du processus de transition d'un modèle d'école à un autre, mais dont la configuration est encore insaisissable. L'approche fonctionnaliste dominante en sciences sociales comme cadre d'interprétation des dynamiques sociales trouve ses limites dans un contexte perturbé par une crise comme celle du Covid qui a nécessité le recours à une batterie de mesures exigeant en conséquence pour comprendre et donner du sens à ce qui pourrait apparaître comme anodin de revenir aux référents fondamentaux de l'analyse en termes de classe sociale, d'inégalité et d'état social. Notre intervention sera structurée en trois points. Une présentation des grandes tendances relatives au vécu durant la pandémie, à partir de l'enquête, bien sûr. Un deuxième point, un focus sur l'école de manière particulière. Et enfin, quelques pistes de réflexion. Alors, l'urgence de recueillir des données pour apprécier le degré de changement dans le vécu de tout un chacun s'est posée d'elle-même pour éviter supputation et récits fantasques. Établir un état des lieux aussi partiel soit-il, donne un ancrage réaliste aux analyses. 
Au-delà des, des savoirs acquis de proximité, il y a lieu d'interroger tous les segments de la vie sociale. Il s'agira de mettre l'accent sur les singularités d'une société, même si on sait que l'ailleurs n'est pas totalement différent, et où regagner la confiance en même temps que continuer à agir face aux nombreuses zones d'incertitude constitue un enjeu majeur. L'état des lieux des bouleversements provoqués par la COVID-19 s'appuiera sur les vécus et les perceptions, tout en partant d'emblée de l'hypothèse inégale selon le genre, selon la catégorie sociale et selon le contexte urbain ou rural, avec les conséquences sur la famille, le travail et la formation. Pour la question du travail, nous sommes partis de l'hypothèse que la pandémie COVID-19 a constitué une opportunité pour certains et a fragilisé la situation pour d'autres. Une opportunité notamment pour les salariés fonctionnaires et pour les femmes de la fonction publique et à fragiliser les personnels indépendants ou libéraux. Les indices de vulnérabilité dans le champ du travail ont été identifiés à partir du revenu, du poste occupé, du temps de travail et de l'affiliation à la Caisse de sécurité sociale. Pour la formation, la construction des indices de vulnérabilité scolaire classés comme élevés, moyens ou faibles prenait en ligne de compte l'organisation du temps scolaire, les résultats scolaires antérieurs et la situation sociale de l'intervenant. L'indice relatif au climat familial, souvent détérioré, avec une violence visible ou silencieuse, a été appréhendé à partir des variables relationnelles et de la répartition des tâches au sein du couple et des relations par enfant. Un focus donc a été fait sur l'école où on s'est posé la question justement de ce passage éventuel d'un autre type d'école. Alors la pandémie interroge le devenir et les réalités de l'état social à travers les modalités de gestion de crise rendant parfois visible la pauvreté. Le contexte national et international avec la pandémie COVID-19 interroge les modes et les types de solidarité en situation d'attermoiement des politiques publiques amenant au renforcement des liens familiaux et communautaires. Donc, élaborer des, des typologies, bon, comme dans toute, euh, toute action dans les sciences sociales. Alors, peut-on considérer le risque comme une entrée possible pour saisir le sens des changements en cours dans nos sociétés, des enjeux et des défis auxquels il est fait face. Donc c'est sur le quotidien des vécus familiaux et individuels et construit en prenant en ligne de compte les trois temps de la pandémie, celui de la panique, celui de la prise d'action et celui du relâchement que euh, nos analyses ont été menées. Alors quelles ont été très globalement les réalités de ce vécu individuel et familial alors, il a eu le, la, la Covid a eu des, des répercussions fortes pour l'écrasante majorité de la population et l'effet psychologique de la pandémie sur l'humeur est extrêmement important. Alors, sur les 1200 euh, ménages interrogés, alors seuls 21% déclarent avoir été communé, euh, condamné, contaminés pardon, par la Covid et a eu affaire avec le système de santé, hôpital ou médecin. Mais seuls moins du tiers d'entre eux ont pu faire un test révélateur du Covid. Est-ce dû à un problème de disponibilité, de moyens financiers, d'organisation ou de non-croyance à l'utilité du test En élargissant les réponses sur la contamination au-delà de la famille nucléaire, c'est plus de la moitié des familles qui ont contacté, contracté la Covid. Et de ces personnes à tête du Covid, 10,8% sont décédées. Nous avons constaté par ailleurs la tendance à déclarer plus facilement la maladie des autres, même quand celle-ci fait partie de la famille, que de s'exprimer sur soi-même. Alors, je vais, euh, je vais aller vite. Je vais donner simplement un certain nombre de titres. Donc, les besoins des familles en période de pandémie, c'est d'abord une question de famille. Et euh, si plus de 42 affirment avoir reçu une aide, qu'elle soit matérielle, financière ou morale, la majorité, finalement, euh, s'est exprimé dans le cadre de la mobilisation du premier réseau qui est celui de la famille. Donc la solidarité familiale a d'abord joué en premier lieu pour très loin derrière les amis, les collègues, puis les voisins, les associations et enfin 5% pour les institutions publiques. Alors si euh, euh, plus du tiers de la population des chefs de ménage interrogés ont eu des besoins d'aide financière durant la période dure du temps du confinement, les mesures draconiennes ont eu des conséquences sociales, notamment de baisse de revenus pour certaines familles. Alors, 
la, la vécu de la pandémie et notamment euh, toute la problématique de la période dure de la pandémie, notamment le confinement, les vécus d'un ramadan et d'un aïd sous Covid ou l'arrêt de la convivialité. L'aïd et le ramadan est un moment symbolique extrêmement important dans, dans la vie de tous les musulmans. Donc le ramadan, avec ce dont il est porteur, comme occasion de regroupement familial, de rencontres nocturnes, de sorties de groupe, apparaît pour nos, en, pour nos enquêter comme totalement raté. Et ils sont plus de 85% des ménages interrogés à regretter l'absence de rencontres familiales et notamment les sorties nocturnes après le ftor qui leur ont le plus manqué. Alors, moment de liberté particulière, le ramadan rend licite pour les femmes les sorties nocturnes, contrairement au mois ordinaire de l'année où la justification de la sortie doit se faire et être obtenue. L'écrasante majorité regrette aussi les interdictions de regroupement, particulièrement les sorties à la mosquée, pour le Tarawih. Moins sacré, c'est aussi un mois d'échange et de communion des habitants de quartier. Alors, pour les deux tiers des ménages, l'absence d'effervescence durant la dernière semaine de Ramadan, pour l'achat notamment des affaires de l'Aïd, a beaucoup manqué. Ramadan est un mois aux particularités traditionnelles, organisant selon un timing particulier l'emploi du temps familial et le type de dépenses. Et si, malgré les restrictions imposées, nombreux ont fait le sacrifice traditionnel du mouton, clôturant le mois de Ramadan, en famille restreinte ou en famille élargie, ils sont plus quand même de 10 à reconnaître n'avoir pas eu les moyens nécessaires pour acheter un mouton. Alors, dans les habitudes quotidiennes des familles, face au nouveau contexte, évidemment, l'hégémonie des écrans. Alors, la lecture des écrans, c'est le grand gagnant de la période du confinement, et ils sont plus de 70 à affirmer avoir passé plus de temps devant les écrans durant le confinement. Alors, bien sûr, il en résulte une baisse d'activité physique et la période de confinement a malgré tout permis à plus de la moitié des enquêtés d'être plus en famille durant les repas, mais autant à reconnaître avoir changé ou modifié leur alimentation pendant la période de confinement. Alors, la vie de famille en contexte de restriction de mobilité, ce sont des conflits en augmentation. Et plus de la moitié de la population interrogée reconnaissent vivre dans un climat de violence permanente ou épisodique. Parmi celles-ci, certains affirment vivre souvent et très souvent dans des conditions de violence, mais ce qu'il faut dire, c'est que les, les, le climat en fait, de difficulté a lieu essentiellement avec les enfants. Et durant le confinement sévère, près de la moitié des ménages ont vécu aussi des difficultés avec le conjoint, où les enfants sont encore le sujet de difficultés pour la majorité. Alors, il est fort probable que la faible admissibilité de tolé ou de la tolérance sociale vis-à-vis -vis des plaintes des enfants contre leurs parents explique du côté des enfants des chiffres pour nous considérés comme étant extrêmement faibles. Le comportement des enfants a posé problème à quasiment l'ensemble des familles. Et si pour une partie des, des parents, c'est toute la journée que le comportement des enfants pose problème, pour certains, c'est surtout le soir. Et... Euh Près de la moitié des ménages se disent non concernés par le partage des activités domestiques et 16 des maris contribuent seulement aux tâches domestiques selon la demande et avec 14 en cas de besoin, notamment de maladie. Visiblement, le conjoint qui ne partageait pas les activités domestiques avant le confinement n'a pas changé de comportement. Les activités des enfants durant le confinement a, euh, notamment sur la question scolaire, a amené à une aggravation des euh, inégalités. Alors, euh, surtout durant la fermeture des, des, des écoles, certains ont pu euh, assurer la continuité pédagogique. Elle ne l'était pas du côté des pouvoirs publics, mais très peu de familles ont pu en donner. Malgré le fait que les cours d'une chaîne publique créée spécialement, qu'on appelait chaîne du savoir, le Marifa, ont été très, très faiblement suivis par les enfants. Alors, euh, ce qu'être non actif et devenir non actif durant la pandémie, alors, euh, de la population ménage enquêtée, beaucoup ont perdu leur emploi. Et euh, leur statut était celui de salarié non permanent et très peu exercé comme un permanent. L'enquête confirme que le secteur privé a été responsable de près de 88 de mise en chômage ces personnels. Et c'est d'abord l'arrêt de l'activité qui justifie la mise en chômage temporaire, puis la fin de contrat 
et enfin le licenciement. Mais la prise en charge par la famille de ces chômeurs est confirmée par l'enquête. La pandémie Covid-19 constitue une raison suffisante pour plus de la moitié de nos enquêtés pour accepter malgré tout de voir la rémunération baisser et avoir une disponibilité à travailler même en sous-qualification. Les démarches pour un emploi ont été très difficiles et aussi difficiles euh, pendant la, la période de Covid, mais euh, c'est à un emploi de salarié permanent dans le secteur public que recherche près de la moitié de nos chômeurs, pourcentage suivi par ceux qui ont un choix indifférent, l'essentiel étant qu'ils puissent trouver un emploi. Alors, il n'y a pas de consensus à considérer qu'en situation épidémique, les femmes trouvent plus de facilité euh, de l'emploi que les hommes. Alors, sur les institutions de formation, la fermeture des écoles durant la première période s'est faite sans assurer une continuité pédagogique. Et cela a amené à une rupture totale des liens avec l'école, provoquant une situation de détresse chez les familles. Suivi en seconde période, après le, le, le confinement total, par un emploi du temps aménagé et allégé, des évaluations supprimées, créant des situations de flottement, d'incertitude, même sur les dates de reprise de l'école et des examens. La suspension de la scolarité a totalement désorganisé la famille. Et c'est une des conséquences de l'arrêt de cours pour les élèves et qui est la difficulté dans la gestion quotidienne du temps. Le sentiment de perturbation vécu par les familles suite à l'arrêt de la scolarité est déclaré par l'écrasante majorité. Et euh, plus de, des deux tiers de nos chefs de ménage ont des enfants de moins de 12 ans, soit au primaire, soit au collège. Alors, cette écrasante majorité a eu maille à partir avec la régulation du temps quotidien. Et dans le fait d'être perturbé, c'est la dimension de la discipline qui apparaît posant problème pour les foyers dont les enfants ne vont plus à l'école pour cause de flambées épidémiques. Et euh, près de 80 des ménages pointent le doigt sur les perturbations du sommeil et donc des horaires de, de, de sommeil et de réveil. Alors, les impacts d'itinéraire scolaire sur le vécu scolaire pandémique est très important, notamment pour ceux qui ont déjà redoublé, pour ceux qui étaient déjà absentéistes. Leur rapport, en tout cas, ou leur risque de décrochage scolaire est encore plus important. Alors, les rapports à la lecture et aux autres, en fait, c'est une réalité. Majoritairement, les jeunes n'ont lu aucun livre et aucun ouvrage. Et ils sont plus de 64 Et durant le confinement, même la chaîne d'apprentissage, Marifa, est déclarée être suivie par uniquement 20 Donc, euh, avec l'arrêt de la scolarité, en fait, les, les jeunes et les adolescents reconnaissent que ce sont les camarades qui leur ont manqué en premier lieu. Et l'institution scolaire, à travers l'établissement, offre l'opportunité, justement, de création de liens sociaux autres que ceux de la famille ou du voisinage. Les études ont manqué pour uniquement 28 et puis, c'est le diplôme qui est l'expression de la réussite pour les enfants. Alors, le retour au collège, attente et inquiétude, le changement a été visible. Et avec le retour en classe, les élèves, dans leur grande majorité, certes, déclarent seuls, et c'est peut-être un des signes que l'école leur a manqué. Mais c'est la déconcentration qui est le plus invoquée par nos enquêtés, suivie de moins intéressés aujourd'hui, plus stressés pour d'autres, Moins de confiance en soi. Pour la majorité des enquêtés, les parents ne paient pas des cours de soutien, alors même qu'en pratique, les cours de soutien, les cours supplémentaires, comme on les appelle, sont devenus la norme dominante dans la société. Pour ceux qui en bénéficient de manière régulière, la situation sociale de leurs parents le leur permet. Alors, il y a évidemment euh, un avis par rapport à la suspension des cours des positions divergentes et que, euh, dans la reprise de la scolarité, les difficultés se sont ressenties d'abord avec les enseignants et euh, pour euh, les deux tiers des élèves et en seconde position, et très loin, c'est avec les chefs d'établissement, puis avec les élèves et les camarades. Alors, les deux tiers des élèves ont vécu ce premier trimestre, notamment de 2021, d'abord comme difficile et insuffisant. Alors, des problèmes de connexion et une réorganisation des enseignements non, favori non favorables aux apprentissages, avec euh, notamment l'université. Les étudiants, dans leur écrasante majorité, durant ce distanciel, 
considèrent que ce mode d'apprentissage ne les a pas du tout aidés. Alors, des enseignants et un programme non achevé, avec une insatisfaction euh, totale. Alors, j'en viendrai donc à quelques réflexions d'une société en résilience ou de ce que j'ai considéré comme étant un effet positif de la rente d'un système politique égalitariste. L'agenda 2030 des objectifs de développement durable est construit sur les principes d'inclusion, d'équité et de durabilité. Et l'Algérie, à l'instar de tous les autres pays, a été frappée de plein fouet par la Covid-19. Alors, les, les conséquences de la globalisation et du néolibéralisme qui ont été amplifiées dans le contexte Covid ont impacté les solidarités sociales de protection et de droits sociaux. Mais à travers l'expérience du confinement dû à la crise sanitaire, un constat, c'est vrai, celui de l'augmentation des incertitudes et des inégalités. L'épidémie vécue comme une épreuve a été un révélateur, voire en fait une mise à nu du fonctionnement et des tendances lourdes en œuvre dans la société. Le rôle clé joué par la famille comme espace de solidarité organique, confirme sa place comme unité sociale de base et compensant par là les effets inégalitaires des mesures prises par la puissance publique au bénéfice des réguliers, c'est-à-dire des cotisants à la sécurité sociale, et particulièrement pour les travailleurs au noir. L'expression d'une attitude fataliste cohabite avec une triple pauvreté économique, travail au noir, social, avec des conditions d'habitat, entre autres, difficiles, et culturelle, avec un faible niveau de scolarisation. Alors, si durant le temps 1, celui de la panique, l'État a délégué à la famille le rôle de protection et de survie, et la famille a fonctionné quand même par choc, les représentants élus du peuple n'ont joué aucun rôle et aucun débat n'a été organisé. Les mesures barrières, leur durée, le contexte géographique, les priorités et les secteurs concernés prises par les autorités ont pu résulter des conclusions et des analyses produites par le Comité national sanitaire, mais laissant des marges de manœuvre certaines aux autorités locales. Donc l'allègement des programmes, la diminution des volumes horaires pour ce qui concerne l'école, l'abaissement des moyens de passage au cycle supérieur, avec un changement des critères d'évaluation, continueront à avoir des conséquences importantes pour l'avenir du niveau scolaire. Des conséquences comme des répliques après un séisme. Et c'est à une gestion populiste de l'école qui s'est donnée à voir comme alternative à une gestion considérée comme élitiste. Donc, passer d'un modèle à un autre aurait supposé de produire une argumentation scientifique et pédagogique au lieu et place de l'argumentation d'autorité. La société a été résiliente du fait en grande partie que la population habituée aux états d'urgence, notamment la période coloniale avec les couvre-feux et la décennie noire avec le terrorisme durant plus d'une dizaine d'années, et aussi du fait d'avoir bénéficié de mesures sociales inédites, de protection et de mesures administratives à conséquences pédagogiques visant à fluidifier les cohortes à tous les niveaux scolaires. La forte étatisation dans la gestion de la pandémie n'a pas du tout été une singularité, mais un mode de gouvernance. Obéissance et transgression, selon les lieux, les moments, les motivations, ont contribué en revanche à la reconnaissance de la légitimité des décisions prises par les pouvoirs publics. En conclusion, l'hypothèse que la pandémie Covid-19 a constitué une opportunité pour certains et a fragilisé la situation pour d'autres, une opportunité, encore une fois, pour les salariés fonctionnaires, a été confirmée par l'enquête. Les sociétés ont besoin de sécurité sur les risques. Le vécu social au long cours, le contexte avec ses valeurs, influence lourdement les actions prises par les pouvoirs publics. Mais l'indifférence aux différences sociales dans l'approche égalitariste a approfondi les inégalités entre élèves. Le concept de crise peut être appréhendé soit comme une occasion nocive avec son caractère déstabilisateur et son climat d'incertitude ou comme une un déclencheur de changement. Aujourd'hui, nous assistons plutôt à l'approfondissement dans la réalité d'un modèle débridé, imposé par actes administratifs et progressifs, mais sans les lunettes nécessaires pour éclairer le sens des démarches. Aussi la référence aujourd'hui dans les sciences humaines et sociales, à la terminologie de désoccidentalisation, achève, de faire de la matrice occidentale l'unité de mesure des évolutions qui ont cours dans le monde. Les conflits dans ce monde, en Afrique 
et plus dramatiquement aujourd'hui, la guerre à Gaza, bouleverse et contribue à redéfinir le monde et l'horizon de pensée occidentale. C'est à travers la stratégie déployée dans les discours médiatico-politiques, dans un contexte politique réel, qui rend visible le paradigme de référence à l'actuel ordre des choses. Merci. Thank you very much, Professor Nuria Remaun, for the points you brought to our discussion with another focus. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Professor Rashid, please. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Professor Silva. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lokushi and Professor Remaun, for uh, basically setting um, uh, a very broad and also very specific uh, sets of issues and questions uh, that I would just very quickly reflect on and sort of find a middle ground uh, between those two. I've set my uh, timer for about 20 minutes maximum. If it goes up, I'll stop talking so that the discussant uh, uh, can pull together uh, highlights of uh, what we've said and also there could be time for Q&A. I want to spend uh, that 15 to 20 minutes to talk about really three different things. First, to have a quick reflection on pandemics. And here I'm not only talking about COVID, I'm talking about Ebola. Uh, if you are from Sierra Leone, Guinea, Li uh, Liberia, and maybe parts of Nigeria and Senegal, uh, in one decade, you would have lived through two major pandemics. Uh, the second, um, uh, sets of issues that I want to reflect on is what I call confronting, uh, really confronting uh, the epistemes of disease and race uh, and how the ontology of blackness is wrapped around uh, uh, these epistemes. And lastly, if I do have time, uh, is to look very quickly uh, on what I call engaging uh, the debates. Uh, renew, uh, seeing the old in the new, as you just said, um, uh, bio. So first, let's start with uh, epidemics. We all uh, in this audience, I hope, know what epidemics are. Sudden outbreaks of either existing or new diseases that overwhelm public health systems in a particular locale or globally. When they become global, they become pandemics. We know that epidemics are as old as recorded history. Many people might not be aware that in the 21st century alone, there has been almost on a yearly outbreak epidemics around the world. Even I didn't check the latest WHO uh, update on epidemics, but even before we had COVID outbreak, there were epidemics relating to various diseases going on around the world. And these epidemics, note, are mostly in areas of what's called uh, the developing south, parts of Asia, parts of uh, South America, and mostly in uh, the African uh, continent. So uh, in a sense, we live within an environment, uh, especially those of us who are in the developing world that are prone to large scale outbreaks of disease. So the question for us here, or the issue for us here, is not if there is going to be another epidemic or if, there's, if there is going to be another outbreak uh, of a uh, major disease that might challenge or overwhelm our public health system. The question is going to be when, because wrapped up uh, with our expanding population, wrapped up with the way our society is uh, uh, developing rapidly in many cases, rapid urbanization, but also the way in which we are interacting with the environment, what happens is um, uh, a couple of things would happen. One is existing diseases would either transform themselves to become much more virulent to attack uh, our, our bodies and also attack our health system. Second, as in the case of COVID, what happens is in the interaction with the environment, we would provoke, we would provoke viruses, uh, which in some cases have not had contact with humans. Uh, we would provoke those particular viruses to make that critical genetic jump, not only from being in the wild, not only from being uh, among other animals, but to make that transition uh, to humans. 
and what that usually means for us until our immune and genetic systems are able to adopt to it, it is going to be tough going for us in the short run. So for us here, what we're dealing with and what we're discussing uh, in this General Assembly is not a question of the now or what has immediately passed. It's also a question of anticipating what might come uh, in the future. Uh, epidemics or pandemics are very interesting diseases, uh, especially as they uh, attack over when and cost through society. So what they usually do, if you're a student of history, what they usually do, what pandemics reveal, they reveal the state of where your society is, the level of preparedness to counter that which is unknown or that which it is prepared for. Pandemics also do stuff that is very interesting. Uh, they reveal who we are as a people. Because disease, diseases do two things. Because diseases sometimes put us as people individuals, community, as at our most vulnerable, at our most helpless, in which we have to depend on others, it tests who we are as a people. It reveals the depth of our compassion, the extent to which we care for each other. The other thing that diseases do, because responding to disease usually means the mobilization of resources, sometimes the scarce resources that are available to society, is they also expose the worst in who we are. To get those two pictures, then uh, uh, we should begin to think of those countries like Sierra Leone, Liberia, the MRU countries, and the West African countries, as well as the globe, when first uh, Ebola hit them, and second, when COVID uh, hit those uh, particular society. So on the positive side, I usually have two time covers that I show, which show people in full gear. And when you see the two pictures, Ebola and COVID, you're saying, what's going on? Because our responses to those two diseases seem so familiar in terms of the images. And I'll put those in conversation uh, in, uh, <coughs> in a moment. Uh, on the negative, so on the positive side, shows how caring we are. Uh, on the negative side, really begins to show not only our competition for resources, it exposes pervasive prejudice in society, ignorance, deep-rooted inequities between um, and within communities, nations, and regions of the world. They force us, they force us to sit and take note about the deep power hierarchies, the unequal relationship, and sometimes the cynical political calculations that produce some of the prejudices and sustain them. So COVID and Ebola, two different diseases, I'm not going to go into them. Uh, COVID is much more lethal. Uh, Ebola is much more lethal than uh, uh, COVID, but thankfully it was confined and it was contained within the MRU. COVID, unfortunately, became a global uh, pandemic. So let us talk very quickly, as I said, the second part of my comments and what I want to say, the epistemes of disease uh, and race. So it took me a long time, because we do the book on Ebola, it took me a long time to think about and to say, if you put these two epidemics, pandemics in conversation, what would be the features that would show up uh, about them uh, that speaks to where our world and where our societies are. In other words, how did these two uh, epidemics, these two major outbreaks of disease mirror each other? We know the differences, but are there areas where we can sort of see the similarities? And I made this argument again and again, that in fact, if you pay very careful attention to the 2015 to 2016 uh, COVID outbreak in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, you could understand some of the features that emerged during COVID. But, and some of the lessons that the world should have learned during COVID that they never picked up, probably because of where it's coming uh, from in the world. So the first uh, uh, element of the pandemics 
that we are all aware with is since when the epidemics and pandemic emerged, they were relatively unknown disease. Our knowledge of what Ebola was uh, has existed for a very long period of time, but in West Africa, it was a novel disease. We've never had outbreak of Ebola in West Africa until 2013. Meanwhile, you had 30 years plus of no knowledge about Ebola in East and Central Africa that did not transmit readily to West Africa. And you ask yourself, in a world uh, of the prevalence of knowledge, why did that happen? Uh, we would come back to that and we can sort of think uh, about that. But these are some of the features that I thought uh, was important to share with us and to reflect uh, on a bit more deeply. So one of the first features, and we're all aware of this because some of us are implicated in this, is the first thing that happened both during the outbreak of Ebola and COVID was the prevalence and the circulation of rumors, myths, half-truth, conspiracy theories uh, about the outbreak, where they came from, what was the nature of the outbreak. Even when knowledge of these outbreaks were replaced by ver a verifiable knowledge is that the information that was based on ignorance, that was based on truth, kept on circulating. We, two issues arise for me. So one was in the interconnected world, the way in which technology becomes an enabler uh, of the spread of particular forms of ignorance uh, in a world where knowledge is supposed to be at our fingertips. Half of the room here is connected, is on their phones, uh, on their machines. You are accessing information somewhere in the world or you're in connection with friends, relatives, with technology. So you ask yourself, in a world where we can readily call information a very short period of time, what was going on and what does that say about the world that we um, uh, live in? The second point that is a crucial point, and this, this point I want to emphasize, and it speaks to what you said, Bio, about thinking of the world in which we live in and how Africa features into the world. Unsurprisingly, both with the outbreak of Ebola and COVID, the disease and its impact became highly racialized. The disease and its impact became highly racialized. And first, uh, searching for the origins of the disease, uh, it was never a question of whether or not you could have had those disease outbreaks from quote unquote, the so-called core or the westernized of the civilized center. It was always the search for causes on the periphery. And what kinds of practices from the periphery enabled those diseases to invade uh, the so-called protected body politic. And Africa featured into that. Africa featured in two ways. Uh, if you followed the discussions about the outbreak of uh, Ebola, it was where we lived, what we ate, the cultural practices that just made the disease very difficult to pin down or uh, contain. When it came to COVID, the, the script was slightly flipped. The script was slightly, was slightly flipped. Flipped in two ways. One was that all of the predictions about what COVID was going to do to Africa never showed up. Then the question became, what is it in Africa and about African people that did not allow them or did not lead to their experiences of what the world wealthiest countries, the United States, what Britain, what Italy went through. Why are they not dying on the, at the scale on which we are dying? Why are they not being hospitalized at the rate at which we are being hospitalized? I'm not going to spend time into debating about what, why Africans suffered less from the impacts of COVID than countries 
uh, in the West, but it speaks to what I call this ontology of blackness and sort of the racialization of disease, and especially the racialization of Africa and Africa in relationship to disease and disease uh, outbreak. Uh, uh, we know that the public health measures that were taken first to uh, uh, combat COVID were unprecedented. So if you lived in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, your societies were shut down for a particular period. Less than four years later, the world was shut down because of COVID. And the lesson in those particular measures is not about the public health measures or the compliances uh, but how people responded to those uh, measures or how states enforced those uh, men, uh, uh, measures. The implementation of public health measures became terrain of conflicts between governments, those who were in charge of the states, and people on which those measures were being um, uh, imposed or no people who are being asked. Governments, in many cases, tended to act, especially in Africa, with autocratic tendency, and their publics resisted forthright. In almost, in many African countries, I know that in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, and in different parts of the world, you had protests, you had riots following responses to government uh, measures. And these are very serious, and these are issues that we need to think about. Uh, Two last points uh, on thinking about COVID and Ebola and our response to it. One that is important to us as Africans, again, speaks to hierarchies and ontologies of power. It took the securitization of COVID, of Ebola, for the world to respond to Ebola. So whilst Ebola in the first year, in the first year and a half, had basically overwhelmed the public health system. And why it is very evident that the infrastructure of Guinea, Liberia, and Thailand had been overstretched. <coughs> the news was there, the images were there of people dying. You know what it took for the United Nations, both of the Security Council and the General Assembly, to almost unanimously vote to support. Zion Mia, that is the United Nations Emergency Response to Ebola, it wasn't so much and it wasn't solely that you had so many people dying in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, or so many people being infected. It took the major countries, especially the United States, framing it as a global security threat. They were willing to put that resources only when, only when it was calculated that if, COVID, if Ebola was not contained in West Africa, like COVID, it would probably overwhelm the world. That was when, I'm not making this up, go check the debates in the Security Council. It was only when it was framed as a security threat global security threat, especially to the West, that was when the resources were unlocked. Then you ask yourself, what is the calculus here? Were African lives not sufficient enough to be protected at that particular point? Did it have to take a global securitization of a public health uh, crisis for you uh, to uh, uh, that response? There's a lot more that I could say, but I want to quickly round up uh, and talk about engaging uh, the aftermath of the two pandemics, both Ebola and COVID. Uh, and for us as researchers and for Cordesia, areas that I see potential opportunities and synergies for the work that we've been doing and moving uh, ahead. The first area that I see opportunities for us to continue the discussion it's not only a discussion around decolonization. It's not only a question around thinking about ontologies of blackness and where uh, they stand. I think we need bio, despite the fact that you said, uh, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, there were these liberation movements that fought first on an anti-racist platform to underline the humanity of Africans. 
21st century, we're still fighting that. Uh, the way in which race, this multiple-headed hydra, permeates our world. We don't know until there is a crisis. We don't know until the robber hits the road that we, uh, this hierarchy of some people having some value, more value or that shows up. So we live in countries which are not colonized, but it doesn't mean that we don't live in a world that is hierarchically and racially structured. And a provocation here, yeah, look at what's happening in Palestine. What is the calculus? How many Palestinians have to be killed vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in Israel? Ask yourself, what's the calculus? What's the calculus? What's the equivalence in lives there? So we live in a world where the lives of particular populations are still not deeply as valued. We don't occupy a world of common humanity. We still have to work for that world. And every time we make uh, progress is if we don't defend or guard those particular process, they are reversals. Bio, you said everybody is fighting to have a piece of the African continent. What does that say about the way they perceive us as Africans? Uh, so that's the first area that I think the work needs to be done. The second point, again, I wouldn't belabor it. This is the debate around the political and the political economy. What we're seeing very quickly around politics and political economy, what we're seeing very quickly is all the gains we thought we made in the 1990s were very much in danger of losing, quote unquote, those democratic gains. Look at what's happening in West Africa. Four or five countries in the last six years are under military rule. We barely have any country in West Africa except probably for Liberia that has just recently con uh, finished its election, where we don't have disputed elections. And in a number of African countries, we're having backsliding against democratic rules that were agreed in the 1990s. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the role and what role has, have the epidemics played uh, in making sure that uh, uh, in influencing our governance and our state structures. Uh, absolute last point, as I promised that I'm going to round off on, is higher education. We should be, um, uh, as Godwin mentioned, this is our domain. This is what has brought us into this particular room. And what COVID did vis-a-vis -vis higher domain, uh, a field that is higher education, a field that is ultimately already fraught uh, with issues, is raised all kinds of questions. Two minutes. Uh, raise all kinds of questions. Uh, questions about the exponential demand for higher education that we're faced with. Uh, and how, as a continent, which keeps emphasizing that we need these generation of educated women as well as men uh, to help us respond to the issues and problems that we're facing. Big problem there is how are we going to mobilize the resources to fund them? Uh, second, uh, governance and structure. These institutions are going, they are proliferated. In the last 20 years, we have problems of how these institutions are being governed and run. We have issues of uh, pedagogy pedagogy, and COVID both presented a challenge and opportunity. Uh, Professor Webber, you clearly pointed out the downsides of thinking that technology was going to fix our problem uh, with COVID. Uh, online class, online teaching, teaching through technology, uh, clearly we still need to think about a debate and to find uh, how uh, we can do this very well because it's very clear that with technology, we have to engage and use uh, technology uh, in the future. Uh, the uh, final point that I want to raise that came up for us uh, in the committees that I work with, SSRC and other organizations, is how then do we do research 
when you are faced with crisis. Two points. How do we do research when we're faced with crisis? So it's not only research with the use of technology. The last big point that I want to raise, uh, and uh, I'm not smart enough to think out where that would take us, is our research methodologies, our research approaches, given the challenges that we're facing in Africa, are they the only ones that we could truly use? Are we not in a place where we probably need to think we talk about interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. Are we not in a place where we should really begin to say, think very seriously as social science, uh, scientists to think of new ways uh, uh, to address the kinds of challenges, uh, multidimensional challenges that we're facing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rashid. With the last speaker uh, words, we have a certain number of uh, points to reflection on the future of our continent. And uh, particularly because we are African uh, academics and which role we should play. So I would like to invite uh, Ato as, as our discussant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Teresa Cruz de Silva. And uh, thanks, um, former colleagues of Codestria, for generously inviting me to be part of uh, the General Assembly, um, this very august body of African humanities and social sciences. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say much after um, this very eloquent. Um, <laughs> eloquent um, submissions by our eminent um, speakers. Yes, it's really hard. I've been jotting down all sorts of stuff. Probably I won't understand most of what I wrote, but since I'm here, I might as well say something, right? <laughs> um, I mean, so let me start with um, what, did, what we did not hear the, the speakers say, uh, there is at least one thing that I can point out, which is what, um, what the humanities and the social sciences represent. What are they? Uh, and it's very instructive that we did not say anything about it. In a sense, it shows that we are sort of settled about what we are doing. Um, and we are sort of clear about its boundaries with other areas of knowledge and things like that. But there is a second term in the important term in the title of the of the panel, and that's disruption. Some of the speakers spoke of it in terms of crisis, and there I think you know we begin to get into you know um, like the substance of the thing because um, like the speakers are sort of very very clear. Um, they don't necessarily have the same understanding of what um, these uh, disruptions are. Um, but I think there is one thing that is sort of clear, um, that for all of them, it's not really about the problems that we face. Crisis and disruptions are about the mechanisms that we have put in place as a society to deal with those problems that we face. Huh? So in Professor Remahun, she talks a lot about the state and about representatives also about family. Yeah? Um, Professor Luko, she talks a lot about what you can think of as the post-World War II mechanisms that have been set in place at, a, a, at an international level. And Professor Rashid talks, of course, about what we can think of as epidemic control and prevention measures. So I think there is a very clear unanimity in that sense across the panel that it's not about um, the problems that we face, but it's about the mechanisms that we've put in place. Now, um, so this, of course, leads to the question of what disruptions represent for us as social scientists um, or people doing uh, work in the humanities and social sciences, sciences. And I think, again, in a sense, there is a lot of convergence, okay? Um, the, uh, the, all of them are sort of clear in the sense that um, it's, in a sense, the breakdown of an established order. 
Africa, and I think across all of the presentations you should see this. It's um, epidemic control and prevention measures that we've put in place, the post-war order, um, the state, if we want to think of it as such, in Professor Remond's um, uh, presentation. But they are also very clear that it is a moment that is pregnant with possibilities, okay? Um, you know, Professor Lukoshi speaks about the baby that is yet to be born, okay? Um, so in a sense, you know, something is going away, but something else is coming into being. Uh, um, now, what does, re what does this um, moment represent for us as people doing work in the social sciences and the humanities again? Um, again, you know, the authors are sort of very clear that it is um, in one sense and a very opportune moment because it's very re revelatory, okay? Um, if we think of ourselves as people doing, um, you know, we are, we are people doing epistemological work, we are involved in intellectual labor, we want to know things, then it's great, huh? it's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment because it reveals a lot. Huh? And I think across the presentations, there is a focus on inequality, inequality in a geopolitical sense, inequality in terms of class and gender in Professor Ramon, inequality in terms of race in Professor Rashid. Um, that is very, very clear. Um, now, that brings us to the question of solidarity. Okay, solidarity. Um, here, I think, you know, in a sense, we see some differences, okay? So in Professor um, Rashid's presentation, he's sort of very, very clear that there is an absence of solidarity when we think about epidemic control and prevention measures. Um, beyond the national level, and maybe even at the national level, where um, you know everyone is in a mad rush to secure their own people, um, you see new forms of phobia against people that are seen as other and things like that. Um, one of the striking things about the presentation of Professor Ramon is the insistence on solidarity as the family at the family level. So, in a sense. Um, we see this sort of bifurcation where at the state level, you know, people see the state as having done very little and the little that was done has been ineffective. But in a sense, people are sort of saved by forms of familial solidarity that in a sense bail people out of what is, what was a very tough situation. Uh, Professor Lukoshi is very interesting because he doesn't fall in either direction but he's very clear that we should be very careful with the solidarity that we face. Huh? As Africans, <laughs> as he notes, we have been convened everywhere. There is a Saudi Africa, Turkey Africa, China Africa, US Africa. Everyone wants us for some reason that I don't understand. <laughs> and that when you get so many invitations, you have to sort of be careful. Huh? Um, so in a sense, distancing is problematic but we also have to be clear, we also have to be careful about forms of conviviality whose, um, forms of convivia conviviality whose motivation we are not very, very clear about. Um, now, temporality. Um, I mean, time is something that um, I think all of the authors speak about. Um, in a sense, um, there is some sort of convergence because there is a very, um, there is a lot of interest in the future, okay? In the future as the beyond now. Um, um, but Professor Ra Ramon's presentation is also interesting because it deals a lot with what you can think of as the, the, the present or the quotidian. Huh? Um, so these people facing all of these challenges that are sort of um, being weighed down by, you know, like the intricacies of the everyday. How can they project themselves to think about the future? Uh, um, so is the future a privilege that only some can afford? Uh, um, because, I mean, in a sense, we are always being told to think about the future projects into the future, and the assumption often is that the world is flat, everyone can do it. And those who don't do it, um, 
should be encouraged to do it. But is, you know, um, is, is it really a privilege that only some can afford? Uh, are some being weighed down so much by the, the present that in a sense they can't uh, project into the, into the future? Um, one of the interesting things that I found in all of the presentations is in a sense there is this understanding of time as sort of what, huh? in a sense, um, especially when we think about African societies, um, African countries where in this, in this dynamics that in a sense are new but also repetitive. Huh? And we see this in all of the presentation. Repetitive in the sense that we are being faced with crises that look very dissimilar but fundamentally um, raise just questions about our autonomy, about our independence, about the ways in which we manage our our relationships with others. Uh, the, the basically, the extent to which we can sort of um, define our own um, our own lives. Uh, that you know, whether it's in terms of pandemics and epidemics that are very repetitive, or whether it's you know this repeated call to relate with others. You know, we are being you know that challenge is being posed to us, and it's not very clear that in a sense, we are always learning from the lessons of the past. So we are in this, um, I, I would want to call it a, 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 a cycle, but in a sense, we are sort of, um, we are sort of caught in the same dynamics that keep presenting themselves uh, in different ways. Um, disruptions, what are they good for? Um, There is, there is an extent to which um, we can think of our work and you know, our, our, not just our work, but our, our being as inherently tied to disruptions and crises as scholars. Uh, because as scholars, um, there is a sense in which we are called on to sort of impose order on the crises that define everyday life. Huh? Um, and crises at various levels. But how do we do that? We do that by categorizing things, by simplifying things, by seeking explanation. All of these things sort of tend to fix. Huh? They fix and render legible, trans, uh, transparent, things that are in a lot of flux. Huh? It's about change, but this change is even more problematic because sometimes there are different types of change that are, you know, like Professor Olukoshi was, that are, and you see that in the talk of Professor Remaun at all, as also. She's talking about health crisis, but then there are all these questions of social inequalities, hierarchies, the question of the state. So it's really a mess, and our job, you know, think about writing a book, think about writing an article. It's about taking all of this mess and making order out of it. Huh? So our job by excellence is the production of order out of crisis hmm? or disruption. Um, but on the other hand, and for me this is very interesting, our job also is the creation of crisis, right? Our job is the creation of crisis in the sense that Society is doing exactly what we are trying to do, which is that um, human beings are not necessarily very good at living with disruption. So our quotidian, uh, what uh, Professor Ramon was talking about, at the level of you know, the family facing COVID-19, they are quarantined, their kids can't go to school, and all of that, it is to sort of manage this. Huh? Uh, the, the Francophones speak of it as gérer la quotidien, huh? gérer le quotidien. It's about creating some sort of order out of like this craziness, okay? Um, and this can be great. It's just that this labor is sort of permeated by, I shouldn't say permeated. It is sort of um, anchored in all sorts of inequalities. Uh, and I think when Professor Lukoshi talked about the importance of our sort of being at the table and having an equal voice, okay? So we know about the inequalities that um, 
the inequalities that define the work that we do, okay? Um, I mean, I don't want to say a lot about this, but there are scholars here that have written about the, the intellectual division of labor that often always relegates African scholars to either data collection, um, theorizing is done elsewhere and by others, um, and the ways in which, you know, you folks write your nice works, but no one cites them instead, they will cite someone who has cited you and that person will become famous. There are all sorts of ways in which this work of creating order out of these disruptions is sort of weighted in, with inequalities. Huh? And I think our work, especially as African scholars, has to be the creation of a crisis out of the normality that those who are powerful try to impose. Huh? Not just create, but impose, okay? So when we think about, you know, Professor Lukoshi talked a lot about democracy, for example, what it is. Yeah, it is our job to create a crisis out of a world in which people want to get us to believe that democracy is something that is no longer um, a question for debate. We sort of know what it is, we know what it does, we know all the good things it will produce if we follow it. And there is only one version. So our job is to pose that question. If it's a question of human rights, our job again as subaltern, in a sense, is to sort of muddy the waters huh? in a situation where people want to convince us that um, things are very, very clear. There are good people and there are bad people there. You know the good people, you know the bad people. And the problems that we have in the world is this monumental clash between the two and try to be on the right side of history. It is our job as scholars from this our continent to sort of muddy the waters again. So create a crisis, disrupt these um, circulations of knowledge that um, are weighted with inequality and, 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 um, and, and, and in a sense are being imposed, you know, in various ways, you know. Um, again, you know, there is the work of citation, there is the politics of citation, there is also the politics of funding, you know, and it's not just, um, there, is, there is the politics of which questions are seen as um, valid questions that should be posed, um, and there is the question of methodologies that are seen as appropriate, there is also the question of the forms of knowledge that we see as valid. Huh? So um, you may write your stuff, no one will quote it, and people will tell you, well, um, you can't quote that because it's gray literature. Huh? Why is it gray literature? Because it wasn't published in this or that journal. Okay, the person who read your gray literature, or I don't know, your green or blue literature, and then <laughs> published something in that journal, will get published, will get tenured, will get all sorts of grants, uh, um, while you who did most of the work, who did all of the work, um, doesn't get um, all of those credits. So I think in a sense, um, our work as scholars from the South, again, is to sort of pose this question. And I think, you know, the three panelists have done um, well, par excellence, in the sense that they have sort of modded these waters at, at various levels, with Professor Lukoshi at the geopolitical level, uh, um, with Professor Remaun at the na national level dealing with um, the social effects of a pandemic and with Professor Rashid in line with a lot of the work that he has done. Again, at the level of the conference of social science, as, um, social science and medicine and looking at the ways in which um, we sort of produce these epidemics and pandemics um, and the ways in which they are immersed in politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ato Noma, for the points you raised. Uh, your role was so difficult after three brilliant speakers. <laughs> so I would like to ask someone of the Secretariat how much time do we have for the discussion? Is anybody there? No? So let's go on. <laughs> uh, I would like Can to I suggest, I'm um, sorry, um, can I suggest that we take maybe 10 more minutes? Ten more minutes. Um, you, um, we've, we've passed the, the time that was um, 
it's supposed to be 4 p.m. So maybe you can take 15 minutes. So sorry, I said 10 or 15, 10 minutes. With the understanding that 15 would be fine. <laughs> To open the floor. I'd like to thank the three speakers for the various angles from which they tackle this problem. Uh, between Ebola and <laughs> this last one, or even current one, as one of the speakers reminded us, there were rumors, and I'd like to put rumors in brackets, that these two were created specifically, if possible, to minimize, if not eliminate, the African population of the world. The information was mostly carried in the social media, and was never really taken up in the formal discussions at the level of governments, of our public health uh, ministries. But we have to remind ourselves that between Nazi Germany and the almost successful elimination of the indigenous people in the Western world, <laughs> biological warfare played a very major role. Um, I wonder what the scientific community and the general population may have been saying, if anything at all, during the time of the Nazi operations. Is it possible, just possible, that some of those so-called rumors might have any basis in truth? That's a question. I, I'd like to suggest that perhaps we may want to consider as a social science and humanities community of scholars, the need at this point for us to engage our colleagues in the sciences. Should they not feel a need to investigate some of these claims, even if they thought they were rumors. From where I'm coming, it takes me directly back to African traditions of knowledge. And I still hold, because of my, where I grew up and what I have seen with my own eyes, I've heard with my own ears, I have no doubt at all that most of what we describe with our knowledge systems as juju is actually scientific knowledge, uh, but held back for various reasons. Some of us come from communities where we may have seen that the farmers on the farms are often beaten by snakes and they never die of the snake bite. Have we bothered to find out why so? I'd like to suggest that perhaps we should not be too, so quick in dismissing these things as rumors and just move on with what we've been doing all along. An earlier point raised by Rosa Ulukoshi with regard to the United Nations if the unlikely happens and Africa was granted a permanent place on the security, is it security or insecurity council? How are we going to decide on our representation? Some suggestions have already been made by, you know, towards the Africa Union. Is, does Africa has a union along the lines I say Nkrumah was thinking of. A final point which never came up, but I'd like to flag it. Uh, 
there has been a long-standing movement towards reparations. There's a reparations movement. And I'm aware of recent developments in which we suggest that perhaps one of these days there might be a surprise offer to <laughs> offer as something for the injustices inherent in the system of slavery. What should the what should be the form of the reparations and who should get what? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will take only three of you and I will see if the secretary I feel allow us more time. Yes, Nicholas, please. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Simala, I'm from Kenya. I would like to pick up from where Professor Njido has left, actually he's taken words out of my mouth, but I'll repeat for purposes of emphasis. And this is as regards uh, our reimagining and uh, our rethinking and reimagining African futures. Uh, like Professor Rashid said, I mean, the, 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 the idea that there were fewer deaths on the continent as a result of COVID pandemic, there are rumors, like Professor says, that is because of indigenous knowledge system. That's what saved us. So as a community, Kodesia, uh, Professor Olukos talked about investment in research. How much have we invested in researching indigenous knowledge systems on the continent as social scientists and scholars of humanities? Two questions that I'm grappling with, and I would uh, invite Professor Olukos to help me think through them. The first question um, is the language question. Um, when you are talking about interpreting people, when you are talking about understanding China or any other community vis-a-vis -vis African development, the challenges we are facing, be it development, conflict, poverty, environment, climate change, all these issues, when you're talking about interpretation, you're talking about language, you're talking about texts, you're talking about discourses, you're talking about narratives and metaphors. You're talking about a people's identity, you're talking about a people's culture, which is embedded in language. Is it not possible that as a community, we have not invested enough in the language question? on the continent. And again, I would go back to what uh, Professor Nyindo has talked about. What about indigenous languages vis-a-vis -vis other languages, African languages, but they are not really uh, local languages. The last question is about uh, the, the youth, the youth question. And really, um, what is the place of the youth in Kodesia, the youth in our communities, the youth in our countries, the youth in, on the continent, really, have we, have we done enough in terms of trying to harvest the youth dividend, the so-called youth dividend, in terms of African futures? Uh, what are we doing about this? Because I believe these are key issues that will define our futures as a, a community of scholars and as a continent. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I'm actually going to yield my time back to the panelists because you know we, we, the 10 minutes we're given are already over, so I'm, I'm going to yield back. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, my question is uh, for Professor um, Rashid, and uh, you talk about the epistemics of disease and race, uh, and I'm curious how we can further nuance and contextualize that in thinking about the differential impact, for example, of um, uh, COVID-19 on um, African Americans and other people of color in the United States, in a context like the United States where they were two or two, three times more likely to be hospitalized or die of COVID-19 versus 
here in the African continent where the expectations or the fears that people had about how the pandemic was going to ravage Africa kind of like didn't really pan out. So my question is how can we uh, further contextualize, you know, what you describe as the ontology of blackness and uh, in relation to the racialization, racialization of disease and how those operate in contexts. Thank you. linked to the question which was asked by the professor. Um, among diasporans, the idea of the pandemic, I think, refocused attention on Africa in a different way. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering about the diaspora in this conversation, but more certainly, I'm wondering about the reparations movement, which has grown in strength in the Caribbean, um, Persons like Hilary Beckles thinks that it is the watchword of the 21st century somewhat, and is of the impression that the African intellectual has somewhat disattended to it as an important organizing strategy for us going forward. Fora like Commonwealth, Secretariat, and all of that can be better used to galvanize that conversation. So I'm curious as to whether that could be perceived as one of the new creations, the Black Lives Matter amplifying, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the first round. I will ask the speakers to comment or to respond, so we will have another round. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Ato, for um, your interrogation of, of the presentations. Um, I just want to pick uh, one aspect of, of your observation about the uses to which disruptions can be put, uh, particularly with regard to the muddying of, of the waters in the context of uh, uh, the asymmetries of knowledge, uh, which we have been uh, dealing with uh, for a very long time. Now, I would agree completely with you that that modding, which in part in my own language I called the uh, contestation, the protest uh, element in the uh, trilogy of uh, intellectual responses. Um, is something which I think we have done fairly effectively. But it seems to me that we also at, are at a point where it is no longer sufficient simply to muddy the waters, um, but to begin to think of ways in which we can construct new frames, really coming to the uh, points at which you ended, uh, new methodologies around which we pose questions. See, I mean, we spent too much time, in a certain sense, also being reactive in our scholarship. Uh, and much of what we've done in Codesia, um substantially, has fallen into that category of responding, of educating, of enlightening, uh, of interpreting. Uh, from the early historians who had to deal with such stupid questions as whether Africa had history or not. You know, with some clown sitting in London and promoting himself to the status of a professor and saying Africa had no history before the arrival of the first Europeans. Now, to respond to that and spend an entire generation proving that you have a history, something is lost in that process. Uh, and it, it, it took look, almost three decades of that nationalist historiography for the likes of Temu and Swai from the Dar es Salaam School to 
to begin to say, okay, over and above that, we need to begin to ask other questions about our history beyond what has been framed for us. So there is a certain sense in which mudding the water for too long can also reproduce the same power that we are seeking to defeat and limiting us uh, uh, in that regard. Um, and it's, it's part of what I think <laughs> we, we need to push as the next uh, agenda. It's why I say that, you know, what does democracy mean? What does citizenship mean? What does sovereignty mean? Um, and these have to be interpreted uh, and framed in the context of where we are coming to, but also coming from, and, but also the aspirations of where we want uh, to go, uh, ultimately. Um, it, it takes a boldness uh, of, of, of a certain kind, a boldness of scholarship, I think, to, 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 to move beyond that uh, reactivity into a new way of framing questions that respond to our context and circumstances much more uh, effectively. But otherwise, I, I associate completely with your, with your um, observations uh, about uh, the important role which disruptions can play and, and to see them also in terms of the opportunities which they provide us. And I think there is opportunity uh, in uh, the moment uh, that we are traversing on a global scale to uh, put new agendas on the table. Um, the uh, question of the United Nations and uh, who speaks for Africa, assuming we are offered a Security Council role, uh, I actually take the position that we should uh, stop asking for a voice in the United Nations uh, and simply ask for a new international organizational framework. Um, this order has run its course. Where is the United Nations for the Palestinians? Every principle that the UN represents is being wantonly violated. And um, getting a seat on the Security Council, uh, quite apart from the fact that even among some of the big powers uh, in the system today, from China to Russia to the European Union, there's actually a lot of thinking of what might replace the United Nations already. And we need to have that kind of forward-looking thinking. They say, what kind of new global organizational framework? You want to reform the World Bank and the IMF, have a greater vote in it, but without changing the content of the kind of policies that they drive, it will probably not change anything uh, at the end of the day. So again, there I want to push the boundaries and invite us to push the boundaries to begin to imagine what a new world order that is anchored on equality and reflective of all of humanity uh, can look like. Uh, and it may be that at the end we are talking of a new organization in which nobody has the right to exercise a veto over anything that concerns uh, all of us. Um, I think, Simala, you answered the questions yourself uh, in, in many respects. It's been your lifelong vocation uh, to push uh, the African Academy uh, to pay much more um, close attention to the importance of indigenous languages and the experiments which we have seen and some of the results which you have published on the way in which, for example, uh, instances where investments have been made in promoting local language, uh, in knowledge production, uh, in instruction and the like have been salutary, uh, not just to the nation building agenda, but also uh, the uh, project of, of, of development is probably something which needs to be generalized. But in the context of geopolitics, what I think is worrisome is that you find everyday evidence of, for example, a massive investment by China in African languages of Chinese who are encouraged with state support to learn Swahili, to learn Hausa, to learn Yoruba, to speak Zulu, to dress even uh, the way 
our people's dress uh, traditionally. Um, you find, in spite of everything that may be going on in the UK, a massive investment in language services. Right? All of a sudden, the BBC is interested in broadcasting, even in Creole, even in Pidgin English, even in, and that I think should tell us something uh, as a people. To the extent to which we have Africans who are um, uh, investing themselves, for example, in understanding Chinese, uh, Mandarin, in order to be able to follow conversations uh, in the scholarly community in China. Um, it is done almost as a personal vocation. Uh, a lot more business people, in my understanding, African traders and business people, are uh, speaking more of Mandarin than we have had among scholars. Even our Confucius Institutes uh, that are set up by the Chinese as part of their uh, cultural counter-offensive um, um, are not really churning out people who are adept uh, with the language as to be able to invest. And I think this is, this is where we also need to uh, pay some uh, close attention. Um, Jalani, uh, good to see you. Um, last month, on the 27th and 28th, if I'm not mistaken, of November, uh, Ghana hosted a reparations summit, which also brought people like David Commission uh, uh, to Accra uh, in a big conversation. Uh, around um, reviving the political and intellectual interest in the global reparations movement. And although it is true that, especially after uh, the effort which was led by the late uh, MKO Abiola, you might remember in the days of the OAE, Abiola became the champion, uh, formally designated by the OAU of the reparations campaign. Um, and then the Berlin Wall, uh, collapsed and the AU was formed and the reparations agenda kind of uh, left uh, the front burner. Uh, we, I think, are witnessing uh, a major effort which is being made uh, first to catch up uh, with the Caribbean, which as you said is far advanced uh, on this question, uh, and then from there to uh, begin to see how um, we can make this one of the key elements uh, in the negotiation of uh, a, new, a new world order. I think the case is, 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 is a strong one, an impeccable one. Um, what is going to be done with the reparations funds, assuming uh, the monies were paid out and how will they be distributed? Um, I think this is where, again, the Pan-African question becomes particularly important on our continent uh, because if in the end the reparations resources are going to be treated in the same way as we have treated aid, uh, so to speak, uh, we are simply going to have another wasted opportunity, in my view. It seems to me that a collective approach, a Pan-African fund, collectively owned by uh, the countries of the continent, might be one of the steps that we could take uh, in that direction. Thank you, Chair. Oui, merci. Il n'y a pas eu de questions directes, mais j'interviendrai sur deux ou trois points. Alors là, le premier point, c'est que euh, on vit dans un contexte euh, en fait, de refus de liberté, mais avec paradoxalement une grande mobilisation de la société civile pour l'égalité et la justice. Et on l'a vu à travers le monde, et ça, c'est paradoxal par rapport à une gestion autoritaire des États démocratiques, notamment dans l'Occident. Et nous sommes également interpellés, il me semble qu'il y a une accélération d'un vécu de mal-être, je ne sais pas si vous le sentez, où on ne se sent plus à l'aise avec les cadres dominants d'interprétation des faits. On est mal à l'aise. Donc on est face à une situation où il nous faut produire quelque chose pour comprendre la situation dans laquelle on est. Et c'est pour ça qu'avec notre collègue qui a abordé les, à partir de trois points, les inégalités, la solidarité, la temporalité, pour réfléchir dans le futur, réfléchir au futur africain, 
passe d'abord par une connaissance et un décryptage, à mon sens, qui n'est pas encore fait, de nos sociétés, qui exige au moins trois éléments. Un financement interne, national, de, de la recherche, qui suppose un contexte, un climat, qui est celui des libertés, des, euh, des libertés académiques, et qui suppose, du point de vue matériel, un dispositif institutionnel, pas simplement une administration qui abrite euh, la recherche. Alors, euh, dans, au moment même où les universités euh, sont euh, victimes d'une massification sans égal, dont euh, tout le monde en avait discuté également euh, à table, où euh, l'université est, est sommée de changer, y compris dans ses modes de transmission de savoir, en usant d'une technologie qui n'est pas encore maîtrisée, dans certains pays, d'utiliser des langues qui, eux-mêmes, sont pas, elles-mêmes, ne sont pas maîtrisées. Alors, euh, quid de l'avenir Mais vraiment, quid de l'avenir Dans ce contexte-là, où, euh, finalement, euh, la pandémie a approfondi les inégalités. Et mettre maintenant au cœur de notre réflexion, comme on l'a fait dans les années 90, mais, mais on est dans un contexte totalement différent, ce sont les universités et leur production. Voilà, merci. Thank you very much. Uh, there are three issues that I'm going to try to respond to very quickly. Uh, the first uh, that was asked by a colleague uh, right at the top uh, about nuancing uh, the ontologies of race and how it operated in the United States to the extent as we see, I mean, uh, peoples of African descent of black people died at a higher rate than other ethnicities or demographies in uh, North America. And to put that into conversation with the lack of sort of large scale death that we see, it's interesting because there is never a straightforward interaction uh, between race and the other forces in society. Never a straightforward. Uh, relationship, and we're talking about our race at this particular point in time is operating really within a neoliberal capitalist uh, system. So one way in which you get to and you understand what was happening in North America, especially the United States, uh, with the racial indicators, is to look at structurally how capitalism functions in the United States and how race, class, and gender sometimes intersects and who are at the bottom at that structural ladder that is produced by capitalism. It is unsurprising that uh, the people, black people died at a uh, much higher rate because of a number of factors. So one, one easiest set of proxies you can use is to use what uh, um, epidemiologists or public health specialists call the social indicators of health. And nearly all of the social indicators of health, the positive ones in the social indications are, are indicators in which black people perform relatively badly on. If you look at the negative social indicators, those are social indicators that act against black people, so access to housing, access to health, the kinds of jobs that they have, the kind of support that they have. So that's, that shows you the way in which in a structure, in a system like that, how uh, the ontology of race plays out. The second uh, element that I was sort of thinking about in terms of uh, when you extrapolate some aspects of the social indicators of how it played out in the black experience in the United States is why did COVID spread so widely? And who were the people who were most susceptible to COVID in the United States. So there is one group that you can sort of take out, which were the first group through which COVID ravaged through, that are elderly people, because they were immobile and because they were in places where uh, uh, COVID uh, broke out first and was very difficult and given their stage in life. The second uh, reason why, the second group of people that were affected by COVID, two sets of people, one, were people who worked in the care industry, uh, people who cared for other people. Uh, we all know what the caring industry looks like in the West, not so. We all know what it looks like. A lot of nurses, a lot of caregivers 
your relatives and my relatives, most of them who go to uh, the West, guess where they work? They work in taking care of older people and sick people there. This is what we black people do, mostly in uh, Europe and mostly in the West. We know that. If we don't think we know that, then the secret is out. If you ask the majority of your relatives to work in the care industry, which means that these were the people who are the frontline workers, and therefore, in terms of the way this disease is spread, where people who, until you got full protections, were the people who are most susceptible to COVID uh, outbreaks. If you add relatives who are in the care industry, one out of probably two or three chances they contracted COVID during the COVID period. I have relatives who worked as caregivers, and nearly of the, all of them got COVID because of the situation that they worked in. The second uh, reason why you add that impact was, guess what? They also work in relatively low-paying service industries in the city. They were the last public-facing people to be out. Those who were middle class, those who could work at home, those whose offices were their computers in front of them, guess what? The indicators show that these were the groups of people that probably had the least rate of infection because they were the least socially mobile in the city. So in terms of nuancing how the ontologies of race plays out, if you follow the thread through slavery, post-slavery society, and the way in which contemporary neoliberal Western societies are structured, and we know that is most of our people who are emigrating, either legally or illegally, tend to emigrate to what one could call socioeconomically the bottom of uh, 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 Western society. That's how race plays out. In Africa, with, with Ebola, Ebola became, again, a disease in which class and location played a very important part. The people who were mostly affected, affected by Ebola were not your middle and upper classes. The people who were most affected by Ebola were your urban poor and your rural poor. You could check the statistics. So that was the other way. The last point that I want to make about how the ontologies of race played out. Precisely one of the reasons that made COVID circulate rapidly, it's argued that it's some of those reasons that mediated the spread of COVID in our society. That is social mobility. People in the West tend to be incredibly more mobile than people in Africa, especially in terms of their movement. It's not that people are not mobile. And, and this is, the, the, there is no racial dimension to that. There's a socioeconomic dimension to that. If you sit in planes around the world, except you are coming to Africa, the people who have the most freedom to travel in the world are the wealthier parts of the world. This is, this is a reality. It's not calling out any racial group. The reality is people who are much more wealthier, people who have much more available resources tend to move around a lot. So uh, part of the dynamics was that when you look at the networks of connections of movement in the world, it is not surprising that some of the parts of the world where, it, where the COVID epidemic tend to be much more higher where the world where you add great social mobility. That doesn't take a genius to explain. Last question that I want to respond to, Professor Anyodo. The issue that you raised is a very interesting issue. That's why I ended up is thinking about new methodologies and thinking about uh, 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 bio, as you said, and what you said, Atto, about the kind of normative order in which we're functioning in. So we function in disciplines. We function in environments in which, in those disciplines and in those environments and in those institutions, we, it's not that we don't produce valuable, uh, valuable knowledge. We produce valu valuable knowledge. It's the, that we don't contribute to knowledge. We contribute to no, those knowledge. But most of the methodologies at the end of the day, in terms of most of the processes or the methods, epistemological methods that determine what is true or what is accepted as social truth, is not always determined in Africa or the South. 
because most of those methodologies, most of those disciplines are not disciplines that originate with us. They do not fundamentally come out of our realities. Uh, they are shaped elsewhere, we adopt them, and then we expect them to speak to truth about our lives. In saying this, I am not saying that all of the disciplines or all of the methodolo methodologies that exist are not important and do not generate truths about us, about all groups of people that we should be concerned about. But if you think about particular methodologies, let's think about anthropology for, uh, yeah, anthropology was developed to study the other. It wasn't developed to study Europeans. It was to study Africans. So it was a discipline created uh, for us. Economics, as we know it and as it evolved, came from studying the emergence of the capitalist liberal world. It didn't come from studying us. So in other words, what I'm saying is that when you mention about African existing African knowledge, then where is our boldness to come and to say, this is how we want to organize knowledge? Because the organization of knowledge is not simply a scientific process, it's a cultural process. It's a cultural process. The way we organize knowledge is not simply based on science. It's based on culture and the way we look at our, our society and the way we expect our society to respond to particular bodies of knowledge. So why don't we harness that and organize our knowledge? And that takes up the question that you raised about rumors and allegations or statements or information about the creation of disease and the circulation of particular disease. And I'm going to end up with this rhetorical question. Which one organization or which one body or which one state in Africa picked up that and said this is tremendously important. This is a major claim. It's a major claim about humanity. It's a major claim about our security. It's a major claim about us and in the world and said that we are going to follow this to the end. I end at that point. Thank you very much. Only more three direct questions. The gentleman was the first one. Yes. It's coming. Sorry, we have to close the panel. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much to the speakers and discussants. It was a wonderful uh, panel. It's a pity that we don't have time. Maybe we can raise the, some of the questions in the other sessions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. You're nicely put together. <laughs> Sorry, um, so, so tea will be served in the same place where you had it in the morning. So you just please go up and then right. Now, yeah. Oh, um, we'll be here. We'll be back in 15 minutes. L let's try. Let's try. Let's try. 15 minutes, s'il vous plaît.